Well, let's get started. Sure, you say, we've been waiting. Okay. Um, remember when you were a kid? Well, part of you still is. And Fago remembers, and so does the Fago book. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to take you back, back to before Fago was a company, and back to before you were a kid. Uh, fair enough? Want to see me do it? Okay. Um, before I get really started, we have to have some ground rules. Uh, first of all, what do we call this stuff you're drinking? Pop. Pop. Thank you. We will not be calling it soda or tonic or carbonated beverages and especially not Cokes. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing any of that. Uh, so for tonight, that stuff is all pop. Uh, other ground rules, we're all here because we're curious about Fago, or we just love it, and we love Detroit and Michigan because this is a, uh, a wholly Michigan-made product for more than 110 years. So before we really get going, I need to thank this lady here. This is Susie Faganson. I am not from the Fago company, uh, definitely not. When I spoke to the Fago company about doing such a book, they wanted to have no part of it and would not talk to me. Uh, why would you? Um, I went in, I, I gave them a copy of an earlier book I did, and I'm going to pass these around. I had done a book about Coney dogs, and this book really made me thirsty. So that led to this book. But first, let me start one here. Sometimes people like to read while I'm talking. Others just take a nap. Um, so I was complaining to my students at Michigan State University saying that I wanted to write a book about Fago, but the Fago company was not interested in talking to me about this. Maybe they wanted to do their own. That would make perfect sense. And then one day a student said, do you know Susie Faganson? And I said, no, who's that? He said, Susie Faganson is a member of the Fago family and my high school English teacher. And I said, oh, well, do you have your high school English teacher's email? He said, of course. And he gave it to me and I emailed her and she's a smart lady so she ignored me the first time and maybe the second time. And then eventually we started meeting and talking at Starbucks and I heard so many great stories from Susie that she made the book possible. This is a nice picture taken in her garage where the light was just nice that day and that big red pop clock is in her garage. So that's why we did that there. I didn't get to go to her house right away. It took about six or seven interviews before she would trust me to come to her house. And then I had a, uh, a photographer with me and Jessica, the photographer, took this picture. So we like Fago. Do you like Fago? What, what flavor are you drinking? Rock and Rye, my personal favorite. That's my BFF. And uh, we like Fago so much that we even invite it to our weddings. This giant double cheeseburger is not a double cheeseburger, it's a wedding cake. That can of Fago next to it, Red Pop, is not a can of Red Pop. That Coney Dog is not a Coney Dog. And I don't think those sandwiches and better made chips are what they look like either. That's all wedding cake. The bottles around the background, and if you look closely in the book, you'll notice that some of those six packs have little clown pictures on them. And you have to know what that means to understand why there's clown pictures. Well, we like it so much that sometimes some people bake Fago into candles. Have you seen these? If you see them, like the way they smell and buy one, don't drink the candle. Don't drink the candle. They're not good for that. We bake Fago into bicycles. This is from the Detroit Bike Company. Grape, orange, Arctic sun, a red pop bike, and a moon mist bike. And the sparkles in the paint remind me of the bubbles in pop. That's a bowl of rock and rye ice cream. Nice, from a place in Ferndale. These are Fago cupcakes. And in, the, in just about one minute, you're going to find out why Fago cupcakes are a significant thing. You might say that for some people, Fago becomes a part of them.
I'll let you think about that picture for a minute. This guy, his name was Slacker. Um, because I couldn't get any pictures from the Fago company, I had to go to unusual places. Instagram, eBay, uh, YouTube, Flickr. And so I was crawling all around trying to find pictures, and that's how I found this one. And that led me to Slacker, who gave me permission to use that picture. So let's get started with Fago. We're in Detroit. It's 1905. And this is a picture from Detroit in 1905. Uh, that building in the middle with the point on it is City Hall. It's no longer there. And this is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in what was Campus Martius. It's been moved a little bit by now. Uh, but this was 1905 Detroit. And what happened in 1905 was a man named Perry Faginson dropped in on Detroit. Here he comes now. And Perry Faginson was a Russian Jew who moved to Detroit from Cleveland. He was an immigrant. A lot of immigrants were coming to Detroit in 1905 and around then. Between 1900 and 1920, Detroit's population tripled. And Perry moved into the Jewish enclave, which was along Woodward Avenue, and he opened a business as a baker. And almost right away, Perry learned one important thing about baking, and that was that he, he hated it. Do you know why he hated to be a baker? Can you guess? Yes, that's exactly the answer. Very good. He hated getting up at 4 in the morning and making donuts and cakes for everybody. He wanted to get them fresh in the morning. So before too long, Perry sent for his little brother Ben, who was working in Cleveland for the Miller Becker Pop Company. Uh, ben had married into that family, and Perry said, Ben, get up here. There's great opportunities in Detroit. Let's go into business together. So Ben got up there, and he said, OK, Perry, what are we going to do, bake? Perry said, no, we're not baking, we're making pop. And ben said, we're making pop? He said, well, you know how to make pop. That's what you've been doing. He said, well, that's true, Perry, but I don't have any recipes. Perry said, that's OK, Ben. I have all these frosting recipes. We'll use the frosting recipes to make pop. And so that's how Fago started in November on the 4th of 1907 with grape pop, fruit punch, and strawberry, which we call very good. So they started baking, I mean making, pop in a house not too far away from where the bakery had been. It was the house they lived in. And they used a wash tub, pots and pans, a rubber hose for filling bottles, and a thing for putting the cap on there. It was an awful time to start a pop business. A couple of things were going on. One was they started about three weeks after a worldwide recession began. So just as the economy tanked, they started a new business. The other problem was, in those days, people did not drink pop in the winter. They thought it was a summertime treat. So they're going out in November with some new pops, and people are like, yeah, talk to me in May or June. Oh, this is Michigan. Wait till July. <laughs> uh, another problem, pop was very perishable. It did not last long. So what happened was you'd have to bottle your pop on one day and then get it out and sell it the next day before it went flat. Then go back and make more pop on Wednesday and get it back out on Thursday. So this was, you're always shutting down your line and starting up again. A little bit crazy that way. And the craziest thing to me was uh, a bottle of pop, an eight ounce bottle, which isn't very big, but that's probably about enough. An eight ounce bottle of pop sold for three cents each or two for a nickel. But it costs a nickel or a dime to make that bottle. So every time I sell you a bottle for three cents, I'm handing you like maybe 10 cents worth of stuff. So if I don't get those bottles back, I'm soon going to be out of business, right? I'm going to be broke. So they had to get the bottles back, very important. In fact, in those days, there were laws against bottle wrestling, which was getting bottles and selling them to somebody who didn't own them in the first place. But they did OK. Despite all those problems, they did OK. They did so well that they had one of these. And this was not their first. Wow. Yeah, their first was a one horsepower model. And there's Perry. And you can see, well, you can kind of see he's very happy now, isn't he? Doesn't he look so happy? It's hard to see his mouth in that picture. <laughs> Perry said these horses were very smart. You, if you're Ben or Perry, you're walking down the sidewalk. 
You're going into saloons, you're taking in the pop, you're coming out with the empties which you need to get back, and the horses are just clip-clopping along the street next to you, and you, when you get to a saloon, they stop and wait. <laughs> Very handy way to deliver all this pop, except if you need the horse and wagon to go to the store, because then the horses still stop at every saloon. <laughs> so you have to leave a little bit of extra time for that because they're not going to get you there right away. It's not the fastest. So they're smart, but not in every situation. Um, it, they're doing well. They're doing well um, to get this uh, so soon after they started their company. And they kept selling more pop and more pop. And their business was growing. And the whole city was growing. What was making the city triple in size from 1900 to 1920? Detroit was the fastest growing city in the world. Why? The car business. The car business was bringing people in from all around the world, uh, mainly to this place. This is the Highland Park factory that Henry Ford was using to build the Model T. His first factory for the Model T was on Piquette, another street in Detroit. And these signs that you see around come from the Piquette factory. They don't go all the way back to the beginning of Ford, but some guys are restoring that factory now. And they found this sign and that red one over there, and another one over there, in the back of the room by the pop, they found these signs in there, and one guy was ready to throw them out. And another guy said, well, I think I know somebody who, who wants, that, uh, wants that sign. Why don't we hold on to those? So he gave me the sign so that we can enjoy them here. So Henry Ford cut the hourly, the, 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 the workday down to eight hours, and he raised the wages to $5 a day, and that brought people in from all around the world. And that's what made the city grow, and that's what helped the Fagansons grow, because they kept having more customers come. Now, business was so good that even before 1914, when the $5 day came, in 1912, the Fagansons, Ben and Perry, got one of these. They stopped buying hay, and they started buying gasoline, because they were filling up one of these. And that, now there's a better picture of how happy Perry is. He's the guy in front. And they were making enough money selling pop that they could buy this brand new truck from General Motors. It's a General Motors truck. Now maybe that made Henry Ford angry. Or maybe that's just the way Henry Ford was. At the time, Henry Ford was very controlling. He had you in his factory for eight hours a day. But for the other 16 hours, he told especially immigrants how to eat, how to dress, how to bathe, how to take care of their children, how to speak English. He was in charge of every aspect of their lives, or so he thought. Well, there was a thing he didn't like um, in the category of food and beverages, and that was, well, he didn't call it pop, and he didn't call it soda. And he didn't call it tonic. He called it belly wash. <laughs> and he didn't want any of his men drinking belly wash at lunch. So at lunchtime, he closed the gates to the factory so the men couldn't run across the street to the pop stand to buy pop. And that's how they sold pop then, in saloons and at pop stands on the sidewalk. So despite all of that, despite all these problems they started with, pretty soon the Fagansons outgrew their house and they, they had to use the whole thing for making pop. They had to move someplace else. And eventually they said, this is crazy. We've turned a house, our house into a factory. We need a real factory. So they went out and they built a factory. And they put it up in 1920. It was a modern, beautiful, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, efficient factory. Want to see? Yeah. Good. There it is. Nice. That's pretty modern looking, isn't it? And there is Perry, happy, happy, happy. And he's working at the Faganson Brothers Bottling Works. Well, about 1920, and this was not exactly what Fago had said on its website, but about 1920, they started calling their company by a new name. By 1920, they had eight flavors, not just the three originals. And they started calling their company Fago. They said it fit better on the bottles than Faganson. 
Now me, I think they should have called their company maybe something like Ben and Perry's. But Fago worked out pretty well from them. I think I have another picture from inside the factory. Yes, I do. And I just noticed this like last week. If you go way up into the corner, second from the left, there's Perry again. I recognize him by that big smile. And there's nice, here's a guy smoking pop over all the, I mean a pipe over all the pop bottles. I don't think they do that anymore. But this is the way their factory looked in 1920. In 1920, with this new factory, they could make 75,000 bottles of pop in one day, untouched by human hands. That's how I want my pop anyway. So they're doing pretty well in 1920. I want to show you their neighborhood. For me, one of the important parts of the story was about loyalty. And here's a map of their neighborhood. That lowest grape circle right there is where uh, Perry started with the bakery and soon got sick of it. And as soon as Ben got there, they moved into a house. So they went up one block and up six streets on Hastings, moved into a house, and they started making pop there. And they stayed there until 1920 when they moved back one street and over two blocks to this grape circle. And so they stayed there until 1935. So they're in a very small area, just a few blocks, from 1905 to 1935. And in a minute, I'll tell you what happened in 1935. But let's spend a minute here with this neighborhood. That's Woodward Avenue. That's Gratiot. So they're on the near east side of Detroit. Uh, that street, Hastings, is pretty important because Hastings was also Main Street in this neighborhood called Black Bottom, which was right south of Gratiot. And the story with Black Bottom was this is where all the black people live. Now, that's not why they called it Black Bottom. They called it Black Bottom because the soil there was rich from a river bottom. It was good for growing stuff, but they mostly used it for, for houses and apartments. Now, this neighborhood was the only place in Detroit where black people could live at that time. If you lived over here and wanted to sell your house, you could not sell it to a black person. That was against the law. So this neighborhood was getting full of people, many of whom were brought up to the north from Alabama and other places in the south by Henry Ford. Uh, to work at his car factory, which was up Woodward Avenue. So Fago was started in the Jewish enclave, which was right next to what became the black enclave. And that's going to be important in a couple of ways as we go along. I want you to remember two things as we take this slide down. One is 1935, and the other one is moving way up, way thousands of feet away to that grape circle up there where they went in 1935 and where they still are. So for their whole history, Fago has been close enough that you could get to all the sites on a bicycle. Now, you cannot visit these sites anymore because this is a freeway 375 was built right down Hastings and a couple blocks were dug up to make room for the freeway. It took out uh, those original Fago sites and it took out uh, Paradise Valley, which was kind of the the heart of Black Bottom. So that's a little bit on location. Sir? Okay, with the increase in demand, who, uh, who made the bottles for that? Okay, with the increase in demand, who made the bottles? That's a good question. Uh, different companies made the bottles, and every middle size and larger town at that time had its own pop company, so that meant they also had to have their own sugar supplier and their own bottle makers. Um, I can't give you the name of the company, but, and there was more than one. Uh, there's a group called the Antique Bottle Collectors of Metro Detroit. They know. And it's a big group. It's a big group. Occasionally somebody shows up at one of these talks with some bottles and asks me to identify them. So I usually take a picture and send them to the people in the bottle club and they can usually help out. So, so here we are, 1905 to 1935. Uh, I organized the book by flavors. We've just been through red pop. We're going into grape now, which is about the main ingredients in pop. What are the main ingredients in pop, would you guess? Sugar, yes. Pop is about uh, water. Well, water is about 90%. Sugar is about 50%. Uh, flavor, that's about a little bit. Carbonation, that's part of the water. It's carbonated. So the bubbles are in there. 
coloring. There's some coloring. Yeah, there's some dye in there. Yeah, all that good stuff that you want to eat all the time. Uh, now, this is Susie Faginson at her house. And she's, what kind of bottle is that? A seltzer bottle, that's right. Some people called it a siphon. And the way those seltzer bottles worked was you could push down on the top and you could have uh, the water shoot out that spout. There was another way uh, to get um, uh, seltzer water at the time. And that was uh, some people got it from a guy who looked like this. Okay, what is that guy called? He's a, a what? Jerk, a sort of jerk. I, I thought the people in Westland were nice. Do you know this guy? But you call him a jerk. Why do you call him a jerk if you don't even know him? Do you, so you just do what everybody else does. What's the reason for calling him a jerk? You have to jerk the handle. If you jerk the handle, then the water shoots out of that thing. And you can make, now somebody told me that's a chocolate phosphate. Yum. Somebody told me it's an egg cream. I was a little grossed out until I found out there are no eggs in egg cream. So then I felt better. Um, where do you suppose this soda jerk is working? I mean, what kind of business? Pharmacy. A pharmacy. Why would a guy be making uh, desserts at a pharmacy? Well, because of the soda fountain. He's working at a soda fountain. So here's what happened. They found these bubbly, this bubbly water coming out of the ground. They decided it was healthy. They began by sitting in it. I feel kind of healthy. And they said, well, let's get some clean water and drink it. That must be super healthy. So they drank some of this bubbling water out of the ground. They said, I feel pretty good now, and I'm tingly on the inside. And then they said, well, wait a minute. Um, if it's healthy, why don't we mix medicine into it? And then you get healthy bubbly water, and you get the medicine. So they started to do that. So it's no accident that James Verner, who invented Verner's around just after the Civil War, was a pharmacist. The guy who invented Coca-Cola? A pharmacist. The guy who invented Pepsi-Cola? A pharmacist. The one who invented Dr. Pepper? A pharmacist. The one who invented Fago? Very good. I tried to trick you. He was a baker. And one member of the family said, this is not a miracle drug. This won't cure anything. This is just pop. Don't get so wrapped up in all of that. I want to show you about another ingredient. What was Henry Ford's attitude now that, that they're claiming this is a miracle? Oh, well, Fago said it's not a miracle drug. They said, it's just pop. Just drink it for fun. And Henry Ford said, Belly wash, balderdash, get it out of here. Ah. Now, this is a nice can from 1977. It's signed by Mort Faginson, who you're going to meet in a minute. And he's telling about the Fago philosophy. You can fit it on the pop can. And the philosophy is, we're going to make a lot of fun flavors. We're going to surprise you. We're going to try to have some new ones pretty often. Like every year, we might have one or two new flavors. And we hope you're going to find some that you stick with. Anybody love Red Pop? Going way back? Yeah, you're a little red. Anybody like grape? Cream soda? It's OK to like more. Oh, yeah. How about my BFF Rock and Rye? Anybody? Hey, OK, OK. I'm just looking back there. I saw some brave people drinking the cotton candy. We'll find out about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, somebody who tried it earlier said, each sip you take is better than the next one. I know she didn't have some diet back there. Uh, there's no diet. They do make some very good diet flavors, though. I use them when I was on a diet. I put them in my shakes. <laughs> okay, so um, the thing about flavors is it takes a lot of ingredients to make a flavor. Grape pop isn't just made from grape and sugar and water. Um, Mort Faginson, in a little bit earlier in 1972, said we have 28 flavors and we use 107 ingredients to make our flavors. Now, some were big hits, like grape, been here from the beginning. We're drinking it tonight. Fruit punch, been here from the beginning. And of course, red pop. Uh, but then there were some flavors that didn't make it. Um, you maybe have never had a chance to drink Fago apple pop. 
they called that Eve. Huh? Clever name, bad pop. They had a, a novelty item for kids. It was called Fago Brow. And the can said, you must be under 21 to drink this product. It looked and foamed just like beer, but it didn't really work. That was kind of a flop. Uh, they tried the same thing with an imitation wine called Chateau Fago. <laughs> and I want to tell you about, so we have some hits, we have some flops. I want to tell you about this one particular flavor. Uh, you maybe tried it at home with juices. It's pineapple orange. I don't know if you've ever mixed those. I have. That's a good, I like to do that at my house. So they, they decided they would make a pineapple orange pop. So they got more flavors. They brought in Florida juice, from, uh, uh, orange juice from Florida, and they brought in some nice unpasteurized pineapple juice from Hawaii, and they mixed it together, and they put in the sugar and the bubbles and everything you need to make a nice pop, and they had a big party to launch it, and they put out a press release to all the newspapers, and what happened next was that unpasteurized pineapple juice was capped up in that bottle. And because it's not pasteurized, it's still kind of active. And it starts growing and fermenting and expanding in the bottle until finally it starts to blow the top off the pop bottles. And pretty soon, all the lights are being busted out in the Fago factory. And they said, what's going on? And then the phone started to ring. And the stores started to call. And they said, your pop is exploding and making a mess in my store. Get it out of here. And the mayor of Dearborn said, this pop is a menace. You have to get it all out of Dearborn. So the drivers went out, I'm guessing with mops and buckets, and they brought back the pop. And the drivers went on strike for a couple days. And eventually, Fago got some uh, pasteurized pineapple juice, no extra charge, from Dole. And they relaunched the flavor in a much quieter way. Um, uh, I want to talk about my, my favorite, uh, Rock and Rye. Here's a picture of my wife. Oh, no, 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 she's not my wife. This is my wife's drink one day at lunch. She had a rock and rye. And, uh, oh, no, that lady over there, she is a, um, she is a, uh, what was that period? I'm too young to remember it. Victorian. She's from the Victorian age. And Victorian ladies, I know she's a Victorian lady because she has a 12-inch waist. I, I think took some bones out or something. And a Victorian lady would never drink alcohol. But when a Victorian lady gets a sore throat or a tickle, she might need a little tonic. And so she has a little tonic glass there. And you can have a few doses of that, and it'll take care of the tickle. Maybe on a Friday night, you might have a few extra doses to help you get through the weekend. And this tonic was called Ryan Rock. Do you know what it's made from? Any ideas? It's made from rye whiskey and rock candy sugar. Rye whiskey is uh, a little bit coarser than corn or barley and blended whiskeys. So they would mix rye whiskey with oh, cinnamon or honey, a whorehound, which is an old-fashioned kind of candy, or rock candy sugar. And it became known as America's first bottled cocktail. Now, when the Fagensons made it, it didn't have any alcohol in it. Um, you can check me on that. There's no alcohol in there. But I think during Prohibition, people felt good. They couldn't get any alcohol at the store, but they could still buy rock and rye, ginger ale, root beer. There was even a lime ricky. They could buy all that stuff and bring it home and drink it. And the nice thing about that stuff was if you mix it with the stuff you were making in your bathtub, you could actually drink that bathtub stuff. Yeah. You needed something to sort of make it go down. So I want to tell you one more little story about rock and rye. This guy here is kind of famous. His name is Harvey Lipsky. And Harvey Lipsky was a uh, chemist at Fago. And what happened with Harvey was that he uh, he was uh, called in by Perry one day when Perry was getting on. He said, Harvey, it's hard for me to climb up all the ladders and the stools and make all the flavors. I want to show you how to make the rock and rye. Now, Harvey was not a member of the family, but he was known as Mr. Fago. He called himself the chief elixir mixer. He's very proud of that. 
So Perry said, okay, Harvey, here's how you do it. You take a couple of gallons of this and a couple of cups of that and a couple of tablespoons of this and a pinch of this and a little bit more of that and you put some of this in there and you stir it all up and then you flap a towel at it and you say these words. And Harvey wrote all that down, but he said, I'm a chemist. We do not believe in voodoo. We believe in chemistry. So when it was his turn to make the rock and rye, he did not flap the towel, and of course he didn't say any magic words, and he made the rock and rye, and it came out bad. It was bad. So he threw that out. He made another batch, carefully following the recipe, the right order, the right quantities, stirring it just the right way. He didn't flap the towel, he didn't say the words, and it was bad again. So he made a third batch, flapping the towel and saying the incantation came out just fine. He said, I don't know what's going on here, but this is the way we make rock and rye. Now I want to take you to the most political ingredient in pop, and that's the sugar. The sugar. Very political, then and now. Um, I got pretty excited when early on in the Fago story, I found out that Perry was accused of buying stolen sugar and convicted and sentenced to go to jail. But it turned out to be a big mistake, and he didn't have to go to jail. But uh, sugar was part of our history in the slave trade. It was part of our uh, history in involvement in other countries around the hemisphere. It's part of our history now as people want to tax big sugary beverages. And when people talk about health, sugar is a very big deal. And it has been throughout our history. And it was during the Great War when the federal government, through the United States Food Administration, ran a propaganda campaign saying, don't eat so much sugar. We need that sugar because we're sending a lot of troops over to Europe to fight the war. So those ships up there say soldiers, supplies, and food, and these all say sugar. So that was voluntary. That was voluntary. And I guess we got through that okay. Um, it was, nobody was required to cut back, but everybody was encouraged to have an apple instead of a cupcake for dessert. And um, the next time was going to be more serious. But before we get to the next time, something else happened where the federal government came knock, knock, knocking on Fago's door. That neighborhood, Black Bottom, it got crowded. It got real crowded. And the federal government said, well, we're either going to have to expand the neighborhood or make it taller to hold more people. So, of course, they made it taller. And in 1935, they came with the Brewster Housing Project. And they went and they were looking around and they said, you know, we want to build our housing project right where you guys have your pop factory. So they had to move. They had to move. They were losing the pop factory. And this time it was Ben to the rescue. Ben said, Perry, I found this place. We could go in here. And this is that place on Gratiot where the grape circle was up there. 3579 Gratiot. That's still the address there. Up here it says... Not Walmart, it says Horse Mart. This used to be the place where Detroiters bought, sold, and traded horses. This was all open. You could walk right in there with your horses, look around, make a deal. And this was the factory that uh, the Fagansons bought. Now, before it was a pop factory and after it was the Horse Mart, it was a truck factory for a Canadian company called Gottfriedson. And Perry looked at all this space. He said, Ben, this is a lot of space. I don't think we need all of this. And Ben said, well, what are we going to do? We have to move. We don't have much time. This place is open. The price is right. Let's try it. So they did try it. Moving here put them right in the middle of an area in Detroit called Pop Alley. They moved in around 40 bottlers of beer and pop. Stroh was there. We had other, a lot of other pop companies. We had Grilly, we had Town Club, we had Bulldog. Uh, Werner wasn't there, but there was a lot of other companies there. So they're right now in the middle of Pop Alley, um, and their business is continuing to grow so much so, in fact, that they started to uh, fill up the factory. Now, before the factory got full, another war came, World War II, and this time the sugar rationing was for real. Does anybody remember hearing about what was rationed in World War II? What did, what did you hear about? Oh, rubber. Rubber, yes. You couldn't get tires, couldn't get sugar, you couldn't get gas, gas. 
Tires, gas, sugar, butter, butter. nylons, yeah. shoes, metal, all kinds of things were rationed. You had to get uh, uh, coupons to buy some things. So here we are, and here's a couple of those coupons for you sugar lovers, so you can buy your sugar. So these are soldiers fighting in that war where they needed all this stuff. Now, the very first commodity that was rationed after Pearl Harbor was sugar. And the last thing to be derationed was sugar again. So it had the both ends. It had the longest time being rationed. So what happened was uh, Coca-Cola somehow has Coca-Cola in Italy. This is for, uh, Private First Class Norman Taylor from Detroit enjoying his first Coke in more than a year. Coke had all along been advertising itself as a very refreshing product. It never claimed to be healthy. It claimed to be refreshing. Um, and some of the generals were writing to Washington saying we need refreshment for our troops. And the way the rationing worked on companies was you were cut back to 80% of what you had the year before. So you take last year's number, cut it 20%, that's your new level. Everybody was cut 20% and Coca-Cola said, okay, we're cut 20%, but we know the troops need refreshing Coca-Cola. We're going to continue to make Coca-Cola at whatever the cost is to try to supply these troops. And Coca-Cola went a step further. They got one of their executives put on the United States Sugar Rationing Board. So when they sat down to ration sugar, Coca-Cola could be right at the table to give professional advice. And so the board came up with a solution that went something like this. Um, you're cut to 80%. However, because we need to refresh the troops, you'll get extra sugar for the armed forces on one condition. Coca-Cola, you must build 10 factories around the world to make pop. And Coca-Cola said, all right, it's our patriotic duty. And so they built all these factories, and they got all this sugar, and they got all the troops kind of hooked on Coca-Cola. And when they came back, somehow Coca-Cola had become the biggest pop company in the world during a sugar ration. Now, Fago wasn't unpatriotic. Fago, in fact, donated, um, well, loaned for a little while, three important resources to the war effort. Their names were Mort on the left. There's Perry, he's really smiling now. There's Herman, and there's Susie's father, Phil. And I think Perry's smiling because now we're going to have a new Fago company with a second generation in charge. It's going to be a whole new thing, except for one thing. Except This is the 1947, we know, because it's the 40th anniversary of Fago. They're having a Christmas party. There's a nice big bottle of ginger ale, and the troops are back. They're ready to have a new generation running Fago, and I kind of like the way they're posed. Phil's sons are on either side of him. Phil is to the outside. That guy, Herman, worked away from the plant, but Phil and Mort, the guys on the outside, always worked together inside the plant, right close to each other, and talked about the businesses they had to, the business decisions they had to make over the tops of two big wooden desks that were pushed together. Um, here, Perry is so happy now, he's driving to work in a steam shovel. Not really. Uh, you don't wear a suit to drive a steam shovel. Maybe the hat, but not, not everything. And uh, what they're doing is they're connecting their factory to other factories that have gone out of business because they need more space and some of their competitors are closing. They became the biggest independent pop maker in Detroit. Here's Phil in the foreground, Mort in the background. They're on the orange line, which I know you think is in New York, um, but here it is in Detroit. And Mr. Mort was Mr. Hollywood. He was always out talking to the press, explaining the company's position on things, being the public face of Fago. And Phil was on the inside, Susie's father, going all around to the loading dock, to the flavor room, talking to the flavor mixers and the chemists, how's everything going here, out telling the trucks to get out, get the pop out to the customers. So Phil was on the inside, and Susie, who loves her father, talked a lot about that. Yes, what is your question? For the 40th anniversary, was Ben still around? For, oh, good, great question. In 1947, was Ben still around? No. Ben died in the 1940s. It was a very tough decade, Perry said. Ben died, they had the sugar problem, and actually, Another one of Perry's sons died in the 40s in a medical 
situation back in Detroit. He didn't go into the war. So the, the, the 40s were a very tough time, uh, a good time for a new generation to take over because Ben was gone by then. That was Susie's grandfather. So Perry's running it, and he's, he's conveying his values to the next generation. We hire locally. We stick by people. We don't just throw them aside. We try to make a very good pop with good ingredients, and we sell it at a good price. And we try to surprise people. So he was trying to convey all these, all these ideas. Well, one of these ideas was we employ people locally, and that's what's happening here. Um, in talking, to, now these guys are working, that's a conveyor line, these are 12 one quart bottles going into these cases. This is a high-low, it's gonna stack them up in the back of the warehouse for delivery later. And uh, I, I asked Susie, I said, did you ever work at your father's plant? She said, yes, I worked there one summer. I said, when did you work there? She said, 1967. What happened in 1967? That's right, Detroit burst into flames, and Susie was working at Fago. Well, the Monday after that weekend, her father said, we're not going to work today, Susie. It's not safe. So they went later that week, and she's driving, riding down Gratiot with her father driving, and there are these big National Guard armored vehicles going up and down Gratiot, and she's like, oh my God, it looks like there's a war going on here. And what happened was she, um, she noticed a store over there. It was broken into, and that store was burned, and that store was all gone, and when she got to the plant, not one window was broken. He said, why did they not touch anything in the factory? So she's confused. She walks in, and on her father's big wooden desk, there's a piece of paper, and she picks it up, and she says, oh, my. It looks like a list with numbers. Jones, $15. Johnson, $20. Green, $25. She said, I think, I think my uncle and my dad are loaning money to people in the neighborhood. They're being good guys. So the people in the neighborhood don't want to pick on them. But I don't think that's it. I think this picture is closer to the truth. That all happened in July. In April, the Michigan Chronicle, the African-American newspaper in Detroit, had an article about employment practices at Fago. And the Michigan Chronicle said that Fago had 60% of its male employees were black, and 70% of its production workers were black. They were from the neighborhood. Where else could they be from? So my guess is that the plant was not touched because that's where people worked. And the little shops, they didn't really have jobs at the little shops. Now, uh, Mr. Harvey Lipsky, the rock and rye guy, said that he was at the plant on Monday and 97% of the employees came to work that day. And the Fago company said, we're closed today. Don't you see what's going on? Go home, hide under the bed. Don't be out on the street. We'll call you when it's safe. So I think that's why uh, nobody touched the plant, and that's uh, part of that loyalty formula we had going on there. Now this, this is the delicious Arctic sun. No, no, this is the moon mist section. It's all about advertising. And as advertising goes, um, well, this is from Susie's house. She has one of those cabinets where you have a mirror in the back and you can see your knickknacks front and back. You don't have to turn them around. It's a real labor saver. And in her curio cabinet, she has her father's nameplate from his desk and this pen set that was on top of the desk. She saved it. And um, here's the story. When they stopped taking pop to all these individual little stores and started delivering big loads of it to Great Scott and Farmer Jack and some of those places, they needed big trucks like this and they needed drivers to have more training. And Phil was in charge of ordering these trucks. And he told the truck maker, he said, make those trucks one color on one side and a different color on the other side. So then, if you're walking down Gratiot, you might say, oh, wow, there goes a brand new Fago truck, a nice red one. Wow, they must have spent a lot of money on that truck. And then a little later, say, oh, there goes another Fago truck, a blue one. How many trucks did they buy? So this was one of the little tricks her father used to try to make the company seem very successful. And it was. This is what some people call a, uh, a ghost sign. 
This was painted on the side of a store. You pay the owner and you can paint your billboard, if you will, on their wall. And then, of course, later if they want to add some windows, they do it right in the middle of your ad. But uh, I, I saw this picture online. It was taken by a guy whose name was Nailhead. And so I wrote to him. I said, Dear Mr. Nailhead, um, I saw your pictures. I'd like to use them. What's going on? My favorite question. And he said, Well, I always drive the surface streets. I don't take the freeways. And I noticed these guys with the ladders were redoing the sign. And I stopped and took pictures because they had taken the signing off, revealing this sign I had never seen before. And when I went back the next day, it was covered over with the new siding. It might still be there underneath the siding. So that's a ghost sign. Now this was maybe the most famous ghost sign that Fago had. This was painted on a brick wall on a store, of course. And then somebody built a, st a store right next to that store. So the sign was all covered up for about 20 years. You couldn't see the sign. But good news, the new store caught fire and burned down. <laughs> and you see a little bit of it left right here. And they tore the whole thing down and dragged it away. And then people saw this big Fago orange sign and they got so happy again. They said, I haven't seen that sign in 20 years. It takes me back. Well, it was there for about 14 months before, as you might guess, somebody vandalized it and ruined the sign. And Fago responded by doing this. They hired this couple to recreate the sign on the side of their building. So if you're coming from the east side down Gratiot Avenue, you'll see that sign about 15 feet up in the air behind a fence over the Fago parking lot where it's probably safe for a while. Now, in 1935, Fago jumped past painting on walls and hired a small advertising firm in Southfield called Donor for $2,000 a year. And Donor and Fago kind of grew up together. And one of Donor's first campaigns, I'm pretty sure, was this billboard campaign, which happened in the 1940s. So Donor would have been their ad agency. And I just love the way that looks. This, this billboard was down on the ground on a lot next to a store. It's not up in the air like we have them so much nowadays. But the thing that Donor really did was, was TV commercials. TV commercial. So come on. So this is an artist sketch of a TV commercial. And this is this guy is a pushcart man selling selling a uh, black cherry. So the children are playing, and the commercial begins with them, and they hear the black cherry man calling out, Black cherry, get your Fago black cherry. And they say, Oh, it's like the ice cream man. They get all excited, and there's uh, two little boys and a little girl. The little boys come up with some coins. And they go and they give them to the black cherry man. And in the commercial, the people actually, the kids and the man actually look like the people on that can. And you see one boy has a tin cup there, kind of weird. And uh, the black cherry man pours some pop into the cup. And the boys share what's in the cup. And then the mean boy dumps out the last two drops in front of the little girl who doesn't get anything. And uh, so she looks very sad. And the pushcart man sees this. And he flips a coin over the girl's head, and she hears it hit the ground. And she picks it up, and she gives it to the pushcart man. And he gives her a whole bottle of Fago. And she goes back over where the boys are. And the commercial has great music. It's a bluesy kind of soundtrack. Uh, the background is very minimalistic. Um, the characters do not look like the old Disney characters with the ball and the pear shaped and all that. Because the artists came from the Disney studios. They had gone on strike and been fired and blacklisted during the Red Scare. And the work they got was making animated commercials. And some people credit those artists with helping animation survive from the Disney movies to television commercials and Saturday morning cartoons. Now I have. I have, I hope, a commercial for you to see. Let's see if we can make it work. Oh, the Seikos was a heading through the mountain. The stage they call the Wells Fago Express. The cargo, so I hear Fago old fashioned root beer. The tasty drink with creamy head goodness. Look out, it's a holdup. It's Black Bart. Oh, save me. For my life, I fear. 
Oh, hush up, gal. It's that famous drink I want. That case of Fago old-fashioned root beer. So when they say, which way did he go, which way did he go, tell them he went for Fago! Stand where you are. Black Bart, you are through. It's the Fago kid. Madam, do not fear. I will save your Fago old-fashioned root beer. So the stagecoach went on heading through the mountains. And old Black Bart went off to jail, I hear. The Fago kid. Which way did he go? Which way did he go? He went for Fago! He went for Fago old-fashioned root beer. Wasn't that great? Did you like that commercial? That was a good commercial. That commercial was so popular that it came back 17 years later and they ran notices in the newspaper telling you when the commercial would be on. Not the programs, the commercial. Uh, another pretty famous Fago commercial had this guy in it. I like the way he dresses. Um, do you know who that is? That's the great Gildersleeve. That's right. He made the transition. His name was uh, uh, William Albert Perry. I think that's right. He made the transition from NBC radio to television and some movies. And Fago hired him to do a couple commercials. You might remember them. In one, he's a grocer. And he's selling Fago pop to these little kids who want to hear the whole list of all the flavors. And there was a commercial when everybody was singing, remember when you were a kid. What do you know about that commercial? Where was that commercial? Oh, on the boat. On the boat. The Bob Lowe boat. Incorrect. <laughs> That's what everybody says, see? But here's what happened. Donor had the idea for the commercial in the fall, and they said, let's make a commercial on the Bob Lowe boat. But somebody said, you know, if we wait for the water to soften up and not be ice anymore, <laughs> We won't have a commercial for next summer. It'll be for next fall. So they filmed the commercial on a boat called the Fiesta off of Acapulco in the winter. So the great Gildersleeve got on the boat. Uh, somebody came to one of these talks who came from Donor, and he said, yeah, we flew some people out to be in the commercial. So they got to fly to Mexico and be on the boat. This was in the 70s and sing that song. That song became so popular, it moved up the music charts. It was just supposed to be a jingle. And the Fago company offered these records and the sheet music for 25 cents. They sold 75,000 copies. So you can pretty much get that anytime you want on eBay, but it won't be for a quarter. But it won't be for $100 either, because there's too many of them around. Recognize anybody in this commercial? No. What do you mean, no? I was counting on you to say yes. You see, maybe Oscar? Um, Elmo? Kermit. This is made by Jim Henson, who was the guy who made the Muppets. This is before the Muppets, before Kermit or Elmo or anybody. This is where Jim Henson was learning how to make videos with puppets. And he was making eight second commercials. And he made 200 for a coffee company called Wilkins and 10 commercials for Fago. And I put a link to some of the commercials in the book also. Uh, the way it works is Wilkins, the name of the coffee company, offers coffee to Wonkins, and Wonkins doesn't want any of the coffee. So then something bad happens to Wonkins. It usually involves, oh, a cannon, a guillotine, a shotgun, a steamroller, some kind of heavyweight. It's almost always painful, sometimes fatal. And uh, this was Jim Henson's kind of quirky sense of humor. And so people are watching these commercials on early TV and they go, <coughs> should I laugh or should I be appalled? Uh, in this commercial, Wilkins is sitting on the side of his pool and says, I just filled my pool with delicious Fago pop. And then there's a bunch of splashing and bubbles. And up pops Wilkins and he says, help, help, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And Wilkins says, <laughs> I told him he'd drink some Fago. And that's the whole commercial right there. 
Now, now, now I have to get ready for something different. I need this hat, I think. Okay? Because we're going to talk about the Tigers in 1965. And what happened in 1965 was the Tigers decided to sell their advertising in a new way so that a company like Fago could afford to buy commercials during televised games. Now, it is no lie to say that the Tigers had been selling pop for a very long time. This ad was in the evening news, which we call the Detroit News now. It was in the evening news the month before Fago started in business. And here's Ty Cobb, the Georgia peach, selling Coca-Cola, which you see is refreshing, just like I told you, and five cents a bottle, not three cents. My guess is that Ty Cobb got paid a lot more money by Coca-Cola than he ever did by the Tigers. Um, so what happened was Donor came in and said, Mort, Mort, we can get on to televised Tiger games, and it's affordable now. And that's a little souvenir from 1965. And... Um, uh, so Mort said, let's do it, and then Donor came back and said, hey, great news. Our commercial is going every place we have Fago, and it's going to Traverse City, and it's going to Toledo. And Mort said, great news, that's horrible news. We are just going to make people mad if we tell them to drink Fago, and there isn't any there. We've got to get out of those markets. And Mort said, I, I mean, Donor said, that's going to be very expensive. So what Phil and Mort did was they got $30,000 together, and they made more pop, and they sent it to Traverse City and to Toledo. The people saw the commercial during the Tiger game. They went to the store. They saw the Fago. They drank the Fago. They said, we love the Fago. Keep sending more. And then they started thinking, ah, we could be a lot more, a lot more than just a regional or a local pop company. We could, we could cover the whole country. So they started doing that. They started expanding. They went to Cleveland, where Ben had come from, the Miller Becker Company, now called uh, Cotton Club. They went to Toronto, Pittsburgh. They wanted to cover everything east of the Mississippi, and they wanted to go west of the Mississippi. And they were intent on covering the nation. Now, part of that was to upgrade their commercials. And Mort, Mr. Hollywood, liked to have celebrities in his commercials. Do you recognize this one? Soupy Sales, who said, George Washington may be the father of our country, but Fago is the pop. <laughs> and they used this guy's voice in some TV and radio commercials. Who's that? W.C. Fields. Fields, very good. And his voice, or somebody who sounded like him, was advertising Frosh, a new kind of pop, a diet pop. And he said... Any pop that's not made for small children can't be all bad. Uh, this couple was in one of the windows on that horse mart picture we saw. That's Boston Blackie and his leading lady, Lois Collier. They had like a detective show. And Fago sponsored that. That was one of their first commercials or, or commercial buys. They didn't have a commercial. They just sponsored the show. And they're sharing a nice glass of cocoa cream soda, which... Unfortunately, we can't get any more. If you find a bottle of cocoa cream soda, I, I don't think I would drink it. Uh, you might recognize this guy. Oh, Thomas, Hearns. Thomas Hearns. What was his nickname? Hitman. The Hitman. The Motor City Hitman. He was the one punch specialist. And what's he selling? Fago Punch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See what they did there? Now, my fav I think one of my favorite celebrity commercials was made by this guy. Alex Karras. Alex Karras was a defensive tackle. To be a good defensive tackle for the Detroit Lions, it helps to be heavy and nearsighted. And he was both of those things. Uh, the problem with being a defensive tackle is after you retire, you get heavier. So Alex Karras had, was kind of famous for being on a diet. And he was hired to sell Fago in a diet flavor. So my favorite commercial of him, he's, you're looking down at him, he's sitting at a table, 
a round table like this that's almost covered with one pizza. And the narrator says, Alex, I thought you were trying to watch your weight. He said, I am. Look. Fago one calorie red pop tastes just like the regular. <laughs> and the narrator says, Alex, what about the pizza? He says, oh, Fago doesn't make pizza. <laughs> oh, God, what do they say? Strong as an ox and just as smart. <laughs> Is Alex Karras still alive? Is Alex Karras? I think not. I think not. He, he wasted away. That red pop took care of him. Um, so, there's a pop quiz. Didn't you think there might be one? Okay, let's try this. Pop quiz. Number one, which of these was not a Fago flavor? Bright, Tango, Go, Sensation, or 6040? Incorrect. You can buy, I have a bottle of 6040 at home right now. So, bright, tango, go, or sensation? Bright is a flavor. Sensation is a flavor. Go was never a Fago flavor. I made that up. I think that would have been a good idea. Number two, when Fago launched Gold Ginger Ale, it gave away A, a bar of gold, B, a golden Cadillac, C, a gold plated bottle, or D, a year's supply of pop. <coughs> the pop? That would have been too easy. They didn't do that. <laughs> incorrect. The gold plated bottle? Also incorrect. A gold bar is correct. It was a little teeny tiny gold bar, I think. But I think those gold bars we see in the movies aren't real anyway. Number three. Oh, it's about 60-40. It is 60% grapefruit. What is the other 40%? Cherry, lime, pineapple, or ginger? Ginger. Lime, lime is cor ginger. You know too much. Ginger. It's lime. Uh, it tastes a little bit like a uh, little bit like squirt. Well, with all that grapefruit. In a 1984 newsletter, Fago asked employees to identify its top 10 flavors. Which of these flavors was not one of the top 10 selling flavors in 1984? Red Pop, Root Beer, Rock and Rye, Grape, or Punch? Punch. Punch was in the top 10. Uh, rock and Rye. Oh, shh. Rock and Rye was definitely in the top 10. Root Beer was in the top 10. Grape was not in the top 10, which I fail to understand. Grape was not in the top 10. Oh, they make a good, we have some here. You can have some tonight. You can have some right now. Which of these flavors never existed? Moon mist green, moon mist red, moon mist blue, or moon mist orange? Orange is correct. They never made moon mist orange. Very good. You guys are, you're smarter than a lot of libraries. Yes, you are. Well, okay, that's it for the, now. Now, where are we going? Oh, my. Mort, he's now starting to look like Perry. He looks not happy. It's his job to try to find a place for Fago to build a big enough factory to be national. They have six acres. He figures they need 30. And he can't find 30 acres in Detroit where they can build a factory. So people are starting to freak out, and they're, well, they're mad at the mayor. This is our Red Pop mayor, Coleman Young. He was, uh, he was vocal in his passion for Red Pop. And here they are. There's Mort, there's Phil, there's Herman. They're breaking ground, not on a new factory, but to sort of connect the factory they have to other factories and try to make it until Mort can find a new factory. And people are saying the mayor isn't going to pull this off. Fago's not going to pull this off. They're upset because Werner, with its gnome, has left the city with 300 jobs out. Hudson's, the largest department store in the world, has left the city. It's empty. Soon the building will be imploded. The Pistons, Auburn Hills. The Lions, Auburn Hills. Motown, left Motown. We even lost the pickle company, Vlasic. And people are freaking out, and they're saying, 
are we going to have Fago? Or will that will leave us also? So they are very upset that Fago is going to be leaving the town. <laughs> well, kind of. It's still locally owned by Morley Candy. Yeah, the Sanders, you can still get those turtles. Oh boy. Oh, those hot fudge cream puff. Oh boy. So here's what happened. It was kind of a surprise, and it had Mort smiling again. What happened was Mort realized if we have a pop company that drives pop all over the country, it's going to be hard to make a business because the gas prices went skyrocketing during the oil embargo. And he decided, we're not going to do it. Instead, he and his cousin, Phil, put the company up for sale. There wasn't a third generation to take it over. Susie wasn't interested. She wanted to be an English teacher. Her brother was in Israel. Her cousin was in Florida. So they sold the company. They sold the company in, uh, in, the 80, in 1985 and to a company called Tree Suite, which was heading into bankruptcy and quickly sold it again to a company called Na National Beverage Company in 1987, when the company was 80 years old. So it has an owner, but here's the problem, and here's where we need your help. Here's the problem. People are not drinking pop the way they used to. We used to, we used to, this is kind of a public service announcement. We used to drink 50 gallons of pop a year per person. It'd be like if every one of us drank a gallon of pop every week. Well, we're down to 40 gallons per person a year. So too much sugar, that's what some people say. So people are now drinking water. Now, one nice thing is that National Beverage Company, which owns Fago, also owns this sparkling water company, which is about 25% of the sparkling water market. So if you can't drink Fago, you should drink LaCroix. If you don't like LaCroix, some people don't like that, then what you should do is, well, there's one thing we can do if you don't drink pop and you don't drink LaCroix. No, that won't help Fago. There's one more thing we can do. I want you to warm up for that. I want everybody to lean this way. That's good. Now come back all the way over here. Go back all the way over there. Okay. Get ready. You're warmed up. Which way did he go? I'm right over here. Are you ready? Is everybody ready? <laughs> everybody ready? Does anybody have a question that, or, or a story to tell? Sometimes I meet people who know all kinds of interesting stories. Let me, oh, you've got that, Alex? He's got a okay, question. Uh, for the whole soda pop industry, Yes. what, what was the big controversy is this thing even on? No. <laughs> about going from corn syrup and coming back to sugar? Okay. What, what, what uh, was, neither one of those is actually really great for us. Right. Um, but. Uh, cane sugar. But what were their intentions? Don't well, uh, uh, corn, uh, high fructose corn syrup is cheap. Is cheaper? It's cheaper. It's also not really good for you. It's very cheap. It's subsidized by the government. It comes from corn. You know, they can grow a lot of corn. So making sugar from corn is a lot cheaper than using cane sugar, which mixes better and makes a better pop. It's more expensive, but it tastes better. <clears throat> and so, 
Nowadays, if you buy those glass bottles of Faygo, they say right on there, it's cane sugar. So it was about price, and it was a little bit about health politics. Uh, they also make some pops by mixing some artificial sweeteners with some sugar. So you might have some sucralose and some cane sugar in there. might be a combination. They're trying to hit that sweet spot where they can try to keep the calories down but not compromise on the taste. Which Sir? La which lasts longer, Fago or Twinkies? Which lasts longer, Fago or Twinkies? Twinkies. Twinkies. <laughs> Twinkies. And do they still make a three liter bottle? Uh, uh, I've seen two and a half liter bottles at some dollar stores. I haven't seen a three liter bottle, but I think they might have made one once. Uh, is, it, is it polite to dunk your Twinkie in a Fago? Oh boy, I just gave her a, a sugar buzz, oh boy. Another question? You used to put, um, I used to, we used to um, put ice cream at Fago. A float. You have yep, a Fago float. Yep, like yep. a real red nice float is root beer with vanilla ice cream. Oh, red, red pop. Red pop yeah. and vanilla? Okay. <laughs> We're not talking about A&W. That's next week. I think a and I think part of that is the experience of the frosty mug in the drive-in. Uh, uh, more questions? Yes. During Prohibition, we know that mobs in the larger cities um, took over the illegal um, oh. making of liquor and all. Yeah. Did the mob in Detroit, which was the Purple Gang, right. did they give any trouble to Fago for Not Fago making their pot? I, I didn't hear about them giving Fago any trouble. Um, the closest I come to a Prohibition Fago story is at a couple points in their history, they talked about making beer, but decided not to. Now it's interesting because the Purple Gang was a Jewish gang. The Fagansons were Russian Jews. I don't know if that came into play or consideration or anything, but I, I do not know of them trying to be, uh, of, them, of the mob trying to take them over. But, you know, now that you mentioned Purple Gang and I'm looking at a big bottle of Grape Pop, my mind is wandering. Um, <laughs> Who are the actors? Uh, with, the, with the jacket like this? That was the great Gildersleeve. Yeah. He had a funny voice. Uh, if you want a Fago book, I have Fago books. They're $25 and I'll sign it. Or if you want an unsigned copy, that's $26. <laughs> and uh, I have the Coney book too. But. Uh, I'll back off a little bit. What is your question? I don't know. You don't know. Okay, well, we will make. This young man has another question. Well, it's for the cameras. It's not for us, it's for the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. That's ABC uh, News. Um, where was the factory at, and is it still, does it still exist? The factory still exists on Gratiot near Mac, and they still make pop there. Um, and if you go around behind the factory, which is hard to get to sometimes. They have trucks there for Rippet and Shasta. And uh, there's another beverage that they sell and ship out of that area. But really what they make in there is mostly Fago. They don't really make Shasta in there, but they might uh, base some trucks there. So they've been making pop in that same neighborhood, which is, it's a, it's a pretty sad neighborhood now. There's a lot of empty lots around the neighborhood and everything. But they're still employing people right there and making pop. And uh, I don't think they feel the need to be a 30-acre plant anymore. But yes. do, do they do any tours there? They do not do any tours there. Um, it's kind of a weird place to go into because it's all these buildings hooked together. So it's kind of like, kind of like that. And a lot of companies stop doing tours because of the expense of having tour guides who might be volunteers and maybe the insurance rules. And maybe they don't want you watching them making the pop. Um, but they do have, uh, the book has about 25 video links in it, including a link to something they call a tour. It's not really a tour, but it's a bunch of interviews around the inside of the factory. So it's kind of interesting to watch. Most of the links I put in the book are about the commercials, because they were fun. Um, 
Nesbitt? That orange, yeah, I love that orange. I get it out of the pot machine. Yeah, uh, Nesbitt, I, now I think it still goes. Uh, you should know about a uh, store called Rocket Fizz. It's a chain and it sells all kinds of pop, including pops that are no longer made. There used to be a, uh, a root beer, a caramel root beer made in Detroit called Brownie. You can get that at Rocket Fizz and a bunch of weird things too, like things where the, the, the label is the best thing about the pop. <laughs> and they're just trying to have a cool label. But yeah, I remember Nesbitt Orange. Where did Fago get, uh, what, what the, where did they get the name from? It came from the name of the owners. They shortened Faganson down to Fago. Cut, cut it about almost in half. Well, thank you very much for coming and putting up with me and singing. And can, can, we, can we have more pop? If we didn't get enough pop, can we have a little bit more, Alexis? Absolutely. Oh, there it is. Look at that pop.